I think this audience certainly knows that degenerative um, spine disease and the um, uh, causes of disc degeneration also lead to the loss of disc height and the loss of lumbar lordosis. This may be asymmetric, which results in a tilted vertebra, and spondylolisthesis can certainly cause rotation of the spine. As well, facet disease can also cause asymmetry, which can um, result in rotation and can lead to lateral asthesis. Um, deformity itself can also cause asymmetric loading with this accelerated facet and disc degeneration on the concavity in particular, as well as foraminal and central stenosis. And it can also be caused by surgical sequelae, particularly adjacent segment kyphosis, lateral asthesis or spondylolisthesis, asthesis, and flat back. I kind of think of degenerative spine with deformity in three categories. Uh, one is the degenerative spine with a deformity, where you really should have considered the deformity. Degenerative spine with potential for deformity, where you should be aware of the potential for deformity. And then there's the degenerative spine that has unanticipated development of deformity because sometimes you just get unlucky. And then there are certainly cases that we're all dealing with now, and we have degenerative cases that are treated without a current understanding standing of sagittal balance, and I'll show at least one case of that. So this is a degenerative spine with a deformity. He's a 72-year-old gentleman who basically has mostly leg pain and um, spine load thesis at L4-5 that I think you can see on the middle slide, as well as severe stenosis at that level. His curve is entirely uh, flexible, as you can see here, um, and he actually doesn't co really complain about sagittal imbalance, I mean, cor or coronal imbalance. So if you're in person, I would have you folks raise your hand. Um, should we address the deformity? Because he has a fully flexible deformity. Can you get away with decompressing only? Can you decompress and fuse L5S1? Um, can you decompress L4, 5 and fuse to the thoracolumbar junction? And if can we get away with doing um, inner body fusions to decompress in 4, 5 and fuse the lumbar spine? So um, usually when I do this in person, there's kind of a mix of people who will address the, um, the degenerative spondyl alone versus the entire deformity. Um, and then if we throw in Parkinson's, then a lot of people lower their hands. They're not really sure what to do because of the mixed results on Parkinson's disease, of course. So I actually offered him a full deformity operation. And not surprisingly, when you think about patients and how they consider things, he ran away from me and went and had his... Um, uh, went and had his uh, spondylolis thesis addressed. But I can see at least one uh, respondent um, is ta talking about uh, addressing the deformity, and indeed, I think that was the correct answer. So in this case, they tried for a smaller operation but and ignored the deformity, um, and you can see it got a lot worse uh, after his, deform his um, degenerative operation. So a little bit sheepishly, he came back to me, and we revised his surgery and um, extended him and addressed the deformity maybe a couple of levels more than I would have originally. And he actually did quite well despite his Parkinson's. About a couple of years later, later, he developed some PJK, but remained mostly asymptomatic from that. Um, this is a patient that I wanted to show because it was really ignoring the deformity as well. So this, you can see the patient has a thoracolumbar curve, loss of lordosis with um, a positive sagittal balance. And somebody must have taken a course and gotten very enamored with the techniques of the course. But um, you can see they've done a lot of inner body fusions and some nice perk screws, but totally ignored the thoracolumbar deformity and the flat back. Although they probably had a lot of fun doing the surgery, um, they didn't address the patient's problems. And she needed a revision and um, extension approximately and a NAPSO as well. See, I'm not advancing. So what about this patient? Should we consider her deformity? You can see she's got a very mild scoliosis here in the lumbar spine, a little bit of rotation. She has a degenerative spondylo at L4-5 and L5-S1 with spinal stenosis at those levels. And so um, I suppose there might be some people who would consider addressing her deformity. Um, um, but as Simon has pointed out in the chat box, um, uh, I decided that her stenosis was the main problem and her deformity is quite mild. And so I went ahead and just addressed her uh, degenerative spondylo, her degenerative condition. And you can see that after surgery, she's got a nice upright spine. Her deformity has spontaneously corrected above this. So I was quite pleased with myself. 
Um, and so these are the sequence, sequence of films. And so you can see the post-op film, which is quite upright. But within a few months after surgery, she starts adding on above, and her surgery, her deformity becomes more progressive. And she stayed stable for a few months and then progressed. And um, so eventually we had her decompensation became severe enough that we had to address her deformity. And so I'm not sure how many people would have addressed the deformity to begin with. I think of this case as being one of those you just get unlucky sometimes. And I'd certainly be interested in if other people felt that I missed the boat here. So this is uh, her, her surgery, her um, post-operative imaging. So what what about this patient? Should we consider the deformity? He has just leg pain on the um, left side, which is the con excuse me, the right side, which is the convex side. And we did a decompression alone on that side. And he actually did well. He had a little bit of back pain after the surgery. His curvus progressed about three degrees. But as of two year follow up, he had was doing well and was quite pleased with his outcome. What about this patient? So this is a patient who is a little bit different because he's got a similar curve to the patient that um, I showed on the last slide, but a little bit more rotation, as you can see, severe foraminal stenosis um, at four, three, four, four, five, and five, one, and bilateral symptoms, which may have been my downfall. So he was a golf pro, so I really wanted to uh, avoid fusing him, and so we did a decompression alone. Unfortunately, despite the decompression, what I thought was pretty um, uh, adequate um, uh, decompression, he remained having leg pain and radicular symptoms any time he was actually loaded. So he had to support his body to avoid the axial pain. So a lot of discussion later, we ended up going ahead, um, and again, this is his progression. Um, we ended up doing an inner body fusion and stabilizing him, and he had complete relief of his pain after this, uh, went back to his job as a golf pro, and did exceedingly well until about five years later when he developed adjacent segment disease above. This is a patient that um, is one that I operated on starting in 1997, long before we had a good appreciation of how much lordosis a person would need. And you can see that I've fused her lower lumbar spine quite flat. And so she's spent some time compensating above. And we spent many years blaming her degenerative disc disease for her adjacent segment disease as we marched up her spine over the course of, um, I think it was six or seven operations. And then finally crossed her thoracolumbar junction. And you can see she's quite obviously sadly imbalanced at this point. And we ended up um, having, what now I have recognized her sagittal imbalance. So decided to do a pedicles retraction osteotomy. And even though I didn't do a uh, decompression aside from the laminectomy for the PSO, it resolved her leg symptoms. And now she was taking less pain medication than she had in years. And th even thinking about going back to work, which she hadn't been able to for years. So this is her free and post-op. Again, iatrogenically um, uh, created um, flat back in somebody that um, I should have, that now we would know better. Um, we all know about the um, SRS Schwab classification. And I think this is something that is really important uh, to keep in mind, even in addressing the degenerative problems. And what really got my attention is the fact that addressing these problems and changing your classification can actually not just make your x-ray look better, but improve the patient's uh, quality of life. This is a patient who is 71. He's very healthy, avid road biker, severe leg pain only. Um, it prevents walking and he had multiple level stenosis. Um, I thought his deformity was severe enough to warrant a deformity operation, but since he just had leg pain, um, somebody else thought they could get away with a minimally invasive decompression. Um, and so he went for the minimally invasive decompression. He hasn't really had much progression of the deformity itself, but his symptoms recurred about six or seven months after his decompression. And so I went ahead and did a decompression and fusion. I stopped at the horizontal vertebra, not addressing the whole curve because I was trying to um, keep him mobile. In those days, in 2006, we did not understand the PILL question, and I thought that at 50 degrees of lordosis was plenty for him. He ended up getting some adjacent segment disease, up, and we fused him up to L1, again, trying to maintain mobility. And again, his lordosis is um, 50, which uh, would have been at considered adequate, but at this point, I can measure his pelvic incidence, which turned out to be 78. So we now know that wasn't, isn't adequate for him. He continued to do well. He walks with a slight crouch, but he doesn't notice it even when I ask him about it. And But it's a good thing he's a bike rider, not a walker. 
So during a long trip to Europe, he starts developing increased pain. And you can see he's developed um, severe degeneration above here and ended up um, getting a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. And he did quite well after this and was pleased with his progress. So when do we want to consider the deformity? Um, if you have a decompression with the deformity, um, in the concavity in particular or with lateral asthesis, or if you have a concomitant neurologic diagnosis, if the patient has um, coronal decompensation or fixed sedral imbalance, if the patient's deformity has worsened and fusion is needed within or adjacent to the curve, and certainly if you fuse the patient without considering sagittal and coronal balance and compensatory mechanisms. So in, oops, so in other words, you nearly always should think about the deformity. So avoid creating deformity. Avoiding creating deformity is preferable to treating an iatrogenic deformity. So thank you for your attention, and I'll take some questions now. Oh, thank you. Those were great cases. Um, I have a couple comments, I guess, uh, instead of a question. One is uh, a comment that my grandfather used to make, which is experience is a great teacher, but the tuition is high. And uh, the second is uh, a phrase that I use uh, with our residents uh, and, and fellows, which is um, the, the, I call a lot of these cases sort of the tyranny of small curves. And I think this actually remains really an, an unsolved problem in uh, spinal deformity because it's, um, it, I, I'm just not sure that we know uh, the best solution for these patients. And yes, sometimes we get away with a smaller intervention, uh, but uh, I, we don't always serve our patients well uh, in trying that, I think, in some cases uh, when, when we have to go back in a relatively short order. So um, I see Ted Wagner uh, watching intently. Ted, Ted uh, do you have a comment or a question? Yes, I do. Serena, thanks for showing your laundry. Um, this is a, a chronic problem, but I wonder what we can learn from your lecture. Do we, should we have bone density done on all our patients? Because we have found that every patient who has a density of 2.5 or worse fails within 18 months in some way. And secondly, is it age-related? So it'd be interesting to look at your cases age-wise, osteoporosis-wise, is there some way that we can predict some of these failures? Um, Ted, those are great questions. Um, I think, I think um, I always get a bone density patient uh, on any patient that's going to get a fusion, who, unless they're you know reasonably young. But if they have any risk factors, I certainly agree with doing that. I don't necessarily delay surgery if it's going to be a short fusion or even a decompression. But I do think that having a bone uh, bone quality is important for their long-term he bone health, and particularly of their spine health. I do think there are some, uh, um, it's maybe not age-related, but physiology-related. I think the more fit 7-year-old is going to do better than a couch potato 55-year-old. And so I think the patient's activity level and expectations, number one, it's also reflected in their bone. And, all, and as well as their uh, muscle tone, which is another thing that I think I alluded to just a little bit. With respect to take-home messages, I think one of the key things that I try to deal with when I'm trying to make a decision about whether I can get away with something less versus more is I don't want to burn bridges. And so with burning bridges, I, again, if I'm going to fuse a single, if I'm going to try to get away with a single segment, um, especially a single level fusion, I try to make sure I maximize the lordosis within that segment even when I don't want to do a whole scoliosis operation because I don't want to create more problems down the line. And um, so, again, don't, don't burn bridges. And I think patients, nobody wants an, a second operation, but I think if you talk to the patient about the pros and cons of, you know, um, the possibility of a future operation if their deformity gets worse, then I think they are more accepting, number one, of, of needing it later, and number two, more willing to um, work with you and, um, and uh, recognize it before it becomes too late. So thanks for those questions. 
I'd underline that a little bit. The, you know, I, I was talking about, I mentioned uh, the difficulty of sort of revision operations, but I will also say you know, these small curves that aren't really a problem in and of themselves in terms of deformity, uh, when, if you leap to a thoracal lumbopelvic fusion, uh, that is a lot of surgery, and, and the overall impact of that surgery for the problem you're addressing uh, sometimes, I think, uh, leads to unhappiness. The patients are not happy with the trade-offs when they don't have a greater level of disability. So I think both both are true. Over, you know, going immediately to a large surgery may not be the right thing. Uh, sometimes doing the smaller surgery also doesn't end up uh, working out. But I agree with what you just said. Um, taking a patient that then r realizes they need further surgery, uh, I think they're more accepting of the ultimate outcome uh, than doing it as, a, as the index operation. Um, Bob Banco, do you have a question? You're also looking very intent there. I can't hear you. You must be on mute. Yes, yeah, Serena, great talk. Um, we, I see this a lot in my practice in Boston um, where uh, patients are not really informed about their options. And I agree with both you and, and Bob in the fact that they had no idea of the magnitude of the big operation and the setup for the, what, the, what the small operation might, might set them up. And I think more and more people, at least in my demographic area, they don't want the second operation. If they're, if they're robust and they're not frail and their comorbidities are really low, we'll say, look, I just want one and done. Can you do this for me? And I think having those uh, straightforward conversations with the patients, not that you're, you're uh, um, giving them a, a bias, but you're, you're telling them about they could have three smaller operations or, or one larger operation. And most people say, I'll take the larger operation as long as you can do it safely on them and their frailty index is, is, is low enough. Yeah, Rob, that's a great, great point. And I, and I do think that informing the patient about their options is um, critical because, you know, m more of your patients may choose the one and done, but I have enough patients who would rather have smaller operations because they want to maintain the flexibility because fusion is a bad word. And so I definitely think that, again, informing the patient so they can make an educated choice for what's best for them makes the most sense. Um, I see a question from the audience. Dr. Bowen asked about... Um, about using MIS, and I definitely think that particularly if you have a patient that you're concerned about instability down the line or progressive deformity, that MIS is absolutely um, better to maintain whatever you can structurally. So thanks for that question. I see Dr. Chanel is I, yes. <laughs> unmuted. Thanks. Uh, am I, yeah, I, um, I just want to make a comment when we were on the bone density. In my experience, Osteoporosis hasn't really hurt me with cervical surgery because if it's there, you just do 360s and the head is, doesn't weigh much and the hardware is strong. But where it hurts you is if you do the long one and say you stop at seven or two or three, you can just uh, mark on your calendar a couple months in the, down the road and you'll see a wedge deformity right below where you stopped and, and it'll just travel all the way down the thoracic spine. So it's also important in this area, not locally, but as you get down lower in the thoracic spine.